You know, as we move through life, one of the most common questions that we ask our, we ask other people and that people ask us is, where are you from? And I really don't like that question. I'll tell you why in a bit. But people ask me that with a certain degree of curiosity, because my name is Selim Haddad, which is, a, which is quite an Arabic name. But I'm fair-skinned and I've got blue eyes. And my accent is what I like to call TV American, which happens when you watch a lot of American television growing up. But I roll my eyes occasionally, and I'm sure as you'll notice throughout this talk, I might mispronounce one or two words. Um, and if you haven't read my bio, you might be wondering, okay, well, where is he from? And I'll, and I'll tell you. My mother is, she was born in Baghdad, she's Muslim. She was born to an Iraqi father and a German mother. But her father was a diplomat, so she moved around a lot. And in fact, one of the first languages she spoke was Chinese. Um, my father uh, was Christian. He was born in Beirut to a Lebanese father and a Palestinian mother. But even that is sort of complicated, because back then, there were no clear-cut borders between countries, and so there's constant debate from my dad's side of the family over where we're from. I mean, are we originally Syrian, or are we from the mountains of Lebanon, or are we from the Palestinian cities of Haifa or Nazareth? And, I mean, how far back do you go? And then if we weren't going to go too far back, right? So if we're going to start with me, I was born in Kuwait City. My parents were living and working there at the time. But we left during the Gulf War in 1990. Uh, I moved to Cyprus and then to Jordan, and then I went to go study in Canada for four years. I came back to the Middle East, and for the past nine years I've been living and working in London. My partner of seven years is British, so that impacts how I also identify with the UK. Um, and I myself now am a British citizen, which I'm, which I'm very proud about, but I'm also proud that I'm a Lebanese citizen and a Jordanian citizen. <laughs> and the idea of having such a complicated answer to what should be at face value a pretty easy question isn't as exciting or as exotic as it may seem. And in fact, for a long period of time, I would feel a sense of shame and, and nervousness when someone would ask, where are you from? You know, I, I felt like I was complicating things too much. Why couldn't I just have a very simple answer? And in fact, some people would ask me, well, where do you feel like you're from, deep inside? But that to me is like trying to pick your favorite book or your favorite movie. It, it just is impossible. I feel like I'm all of those things, but also none of them really entirely. And I want to talk a bit about identity, but I want to do it through five snapshots from my own life and just keep it personal and simple. And I want to talk a bit about how we define and redefine ourselves, of how our external environment <coughs> might shape how we see ourselves. And I want to talk about difference and, and the, the revolutionary potential of deviating from rigid labels that we often not just put ourselves in, but also each other. And I should say at the outset that I don't have answers. I've just got questions and some ideas, and, and please feel free to disagree with me at the end of the talk. That would be great, actually. <laughs> so, the first snapshot, Amman, Jordan, 1999. I'm 16 years old. In the middle of studying for my GCSEs, I am obsessed with British pop music, and I secretly recreate S Club 7 dance routines in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, I also forced my two brothers to do this as well. <laughs> But I've also developed another habit, and yet another nervous tick to act my long list of nervous ticks. And that's that I've begun to lock myself in the bathroom about two or three times per day. And back then I remember loving the bathroom. It was, it was small, it was enclosed, protected, there were no windows. And I would stand there and I would, I would stare at my reflection in the bathroom mirror and I would turn on the faucets to drown out any noise. And then slowly and very softly, so that no one could hear, I'd whisper two words to my reflection. I'm gay. And I did this many times over the next year. I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. I was trying to fit into this word, this word. At the time, it, it seemed completely alien from everything around me, my family, my friends, my community. It, was, it felt like something that was completely out there. I'd come across it occasionally in magazines or on the newspapers. But it, I, I'd never seen anything like it in my immediate day-to-day -day life. And I really didn't want to be different. It made me feel very, very different. And I knew I was a bit weird, right? But I didn't want to be different. I wanted to be normal. I wanted to be a man. I wanted to get into fights. I wanted to be attracted to girls in school like the rest of my friends were. But all I could do was whisper that word to myself over and over again and, and watch as this barrier began to emerge between me and, and everything I knew and loved. Snapshot to Kingston, Ontario, 2001. I've just arrived in Canada for four years of study at university. 
And I'm nervous and I'm excited. I'm nervous because I've never been outside of the Middle East for more than a few weeks at a time, let alone halfway across the world by myself. But I'm also excited, right? Because I think this is my chance. This is my chance now to, to explore that word I've been whispering to myself in the bathroom mirror, break down this barrier that I've begun to form. But this is North America, September 2001. And overnight, I no longer became gay. It seemed that I had become something new. I had become Arab. And it sounds weird to say now, but back then, it had never really occurred to me that I was Arab. I mean, remember, I had grown up in the Middle East, right? We were, almost all of us were Arab. But the label was so common, it was invisible. So we were all Arab, yes, but some of us were Christian, some were Muslim, some were dark-skinned, some were light-skinned, some were rich, some were poor. There were all these other sub-identities that seemed to, to hold more importance. And besides that, what it meant to be Arab in North America at the time was shaped by something completely new to me. It was shaped by military strategies, it was shaped by media representations and national and foreign policies. It meant having to answer questions about women's rights in the region, and having to patiently explain to people that no, we didn't hate Americans, but we're not really happy with your government, but we don't hate you guys. <laughs> it meant having to disassociate between why fighting for justice for Palestine had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. And I remember wanting to tell people at the time, Look, I can't even ask out this boy that I have a crush on in school, and you want me to solve the Palestinian-Israeli crisis? <laughs> but, but, but instead I read, and it was in the books that I began to understand. And there was one book in particular that spoke to me more than any of the others, and that was Amin Ma'luf's In the Name of Identity. Now, Amin Ma'luf is, is this Lebanese thinker and writer. And for him, identity is a human need. We all want to belong in somewhere. But within us are a bunch of different identities. And we tend to cling on to the identity that feels under threat in the society that we live in. And suddenly it made sense. Suddenly it made sense why in North America, September 2001, I no longer felt gay. And that was because my homosexuality was no longer that part of my identity that felt under attack. Snapshot 3, Montreal, Canada, 2001. So fast forward four years later, I've just graduated. I'm bumming around in Montreal with some friends. We're walking through the parks and streets of the city, and we come across this march that's taking place that day. And in big, bold letters, there's this rainbow-colored word that appears on one of the floats. Pride. And I remember looking at that, that word and, and feeling uncomfortable. And this unequivocal celebration of pride felt to me almost like a demonization of its opposite, which is shame. Now, in Arabic, the word for shame is a'ib. And any Arab kid will tell you that a'ib plays a big part in your upbringing. It's a way for families to police the behavior of their children. So there was haram, which was going against the word of God, and let's say the implication of that is an eternity burning in hell. And then there was the social equivalent of that, which seemed even scarier to me at the time. And the implication of a'ib was kalam al nas, what people would say. So I remember having to navigate this as a child, this very rigid, totalitarian maze of AIDS. Like, you know how Tom Cruise navigates those laser matrix in the Mission Impossible movies? You know, it was AIDS to ask a woman how old she was. It was AIDS to eat too much at a dinner party, but it was also AIDS to eat too little at a dinner party. It was AIDS to ask someone if they're a Muslim or Christian. It was AIDS to go out and greet your parents' family, if, uh, your parents' friends wearing just your pajamas. There was all these different AIDS, and it felt so rigid and totalitarian. But, but staring at that, that float with the word pride on it and those beautiful men and women dancing around it, I wondered to myself, could shame have some, have some value? I mean, is it, is it something that I should completely throw away? I mean, to me, shame is a, way, is a thing that binds communities together. It's a, it's a way that helps communities live in harmony. And for me personally, my respect for what was and wasn't shameful was a way for me to express my love and respect for my community and my <coughs> desire to belong to it. After all, what's the point of, of being proud if you're left on the outside of your society, proud but alone? But knowing that I was going back to the Middle East too, where you know, my homosexuality was both ayyad and haram, I wondered to myself whether I could change what was and wasn't shameful in my community, whether I could subvert, right, turn it on itself, and, and maybe in the process carve out a space for myself inside my own community. Abien, Yemen, 2008. I've joined the organization Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders, and I'm stationed, um, and I'm working on a refugee uh, project in the south of Yemen. Now, this project is for uh, refugees coming from the Horn of Africa, so from Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia, and they're making this very dangerous journey across the Gulf of Aden through these pirate-infested waters and landing 
in another war zone, um, Yemen. And when you join MSF as part of the MSF mission, you wear a white t-shirt and it has MSF's logo emblazoned on the front and back in both English and Arabic. And this t-shirt is meant to label you as safe, as a humanitarian worker, as someone who's going to help. But it's also meant to differentiate you from the community and from the complexity and conflict that you know, being in a community inevitably entails. So you put that t-shirt on and you are neutral, you are impartial, and you're independent. And as a responsibility to the mission, I must shed all my other labels. So I'm firmly back in the closet. After all, there's no labor law or employment tribunal that's going to protect you, and the implication of someone finding out about your sexuality in you know, tribal areas in Yemen could not only risk your own life, but the, 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 the ability of the staff to deliver help to the people in need. So I put on that white t-shirt and everything goes away. My political identity, my political views, my personality, my desires, they're all tightly locked in this cage that's as tightly protected as our compound is in southern Yemen. One evening, we're sitting in the outdoor courtyard in our compound, much like in this photo, when there's a knock on the door. Um, there's a Yemeni fisherman who's there, and he's one of the Yemeni fishermen who is our focal point, who lets us know when there's a boat that has arrived on the shores. And with him is this young Somali man, about my age, in these tattered dark clothes. And the fisherman explains that he had seen this young man walking the streets in the village. Um, he had arrived on one of the previous boats, but we somehow missed him. And he brought, them to, he brought him to our compound, at least so we could <clears throat> keep him protected until the morning when we could register him in the refugee camp. So we thank the Yemeni fisherman. The boy comes in, he sits among us, our, our tight humanitarian community in our white t-shirts, and him in his dark clothes. And my immediate thought is, this guy couldn't be any more different than me. <clears throat> You know, he's, he's, we're, we're in the same place, we're sitting in the same circle, but he had this horrible journey, running away from, from war and conflict, and it takes a lot of bravery to be able to make that very dangerous journey. But then I thought to myself, and it occurred to me, I mean, I came to Yemen to, to help, right? I mean, I joined MSF to help, but there was definitely a part of me that joined MSF to run away, run away from my own internal conflict, because I wanted to put that white t-shirt on. I wanted to shed all my other labels that felt like they were at war with each other. And I realized that in some way maybe him and I were, or we had something in common. Istanbul, Turkey, 2013. So the Arab revolutions have happened, and I no longer want to run away. In fact, more than anything, I want to make my voice heard. I want to really shape the future of the region. And I begin writing a novel, and I also join an NGO that works to bring the voices of young activists in the region into the tumultuous transitional politics that are happening at the time. I should say this photo isn't taken in Istanbul for the sake of honesty. It, it was, I mean, it's an insane role, but it was taken in Yemen. But it, it serves my purpose, as you'll see. Um, so I'm in Istanbul for a workshop, and one of the people who's also in the workshop is this young Yemeni activist, and she's She's a very fascinating person. She's from this very conservative region of Yemen called Hadramaut. And she was one of the people who was out there protesting in the streets that, that you see on CNN. She is fiery. She's naive, young, but has all of these very interesting ideas. She's quite conservative. And I should mention at the time that the Muslim Brotherhood had won almost every single election after the revolutions. And, and their supporters were slowly shaping the future of the region. And I felt that it wasn't just my queer identity that felt under threat, but my secular identity as well, and I, and I clung to it with all of my force. And at the time in Turkey, I, I took out all of these fears on this young woman. I disagreed with her opinions, I shook my head and rolled my eyes when she spoke, and as much as possible, I thought, and I can't believe I'm admitting this, but I thought, you know, if I talk about sex and drugs and parties, then at least this is my way to like stop this insurmountable tide of religious conservatism that at the time I genuinely felt was going to sweep everything and at one point, this young woman, she takes it and she takes it, and then one, at one point she turns to me and she's got this smile on her face and she says, listen, I have no problem with the way that you choose to live your life, but it seems like you have a problem with the way that I'm living mine. And later that evening, I decide to test her. Like I mentioned, I had, I had been writing a book. And the book is a bit controversial. It's this sexual and political coming-of-age story of this young gay man at the Arab Revolutions, and I thought, if I tell her about this book, it might start a problem, it might, have, it, might be, it might cause unnecessary tension. So I hadn't really mentioned it to her. 
But that night over dinner, I did, and I was I was shocked because not only had she known that I was writing a book, but she knew exactly what the book was about because she saw posts on Facebook or something, and she was really relieved that I had finally opened up to her and, and told her that I was writing this book. And turns out she's also a writer, and we had a very interesting discussion about writing and the creative process, and I and. We ended it with her saying, you know, please send me the book when it comes out. And as I was walking back to my hotel room later that night, it occurred to me that for so long I had just assumed that me and my allies were this voice of reason calling for a separation between religion and politics, that I had just immediately joined this demonization of, you know, uh, Islamists and people who maybe more strongly cling to their Muslim identity. And, and I'd never really sought to question myself. And I think, you know, globally, we're, we're constantly deconstructing and questioning what it means to be Muslim and the Muslim mind, that we don't really take time to actually question the secular mind. But if this woman, who is a Muslim and, and it forms a big part of her identity, could accept me, but I wasn't willing to accept her, then who was the real progressive in this situation? And about a month later, a military coup deposes uh, President Hamad Morsi in Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood. And thousands are killed, and many of my secular friends celebrate on Facebook and in the streets. And suddenly the secular identity of mine that I had seen as something so progressive and, and you know, smart seemed like this villain in, in the Arab Spring story. The snapshots give you, I guess, moments or glimpses in my own life of when my own identity was either questioned or defined or redefined. And I thought I'd mention this because I think we, we all lie, at, you know, we all have a number of different identities within us and our, our identities are quite fluid and changing all the time, sometimes over the course of a day or even in the course of a minute. And while I think everyone stands at the cross-section of these different identities, I think some of us can't help but straddle the intersection a bit more visibly than others. I mean, whether you're talking about diaspora communities, immigrant communities, um, religious, sexual or gender minorities, for many of us, it can be quite a lonely experience, and, and one thing, and I remember myself at 16 staring at myself in the bathroom mirror, one thing that you really want to do is, is fit in and be normal. But at this point, I feel quite the opposite, actually, because I think, in many ways, being different is quite revolutionary. I mean, I personally feel like I'm Christian, Muslim, and secular, I'm all of these different nationalities, I'm queer, you know, I'm all of these things, but I'm also none of them entirely, because what I am straddles the cross-section of all of these different identities. And within each of these communities, I find myself negotiating and carving out a space for myself inside of them. And in the process, I'm changing what it means to be all of those things. And so I, I guess I'll end on the note that, you know, people who straddle these different intersections should, should celebrate this difference and, and, you know, not have a single answer to the question, where are you from? Don't simplify things. Make it complicated. Because in the process, when you're making it complicated, you're changing stereotypes, you're disrupting the status quo, you're bridging communities together, but you're also expanding communities. And in that way, I think your cultural deviance can be quite revolutionary. Thank you.
very personal, but you know, it's a, it's a global phenomenon that's making us question things very consciously. Yep. Next question. Um, do you find uh, I'm just interested to know how your brothers, what their experience of this identity was. I I also come from a very mixed upbringing and my relationship to that is very different to how my brother feels about it. Um, he's kind of quite like proud of it and he sort of, sort of rebels in this idea that he's uh, exotic and I grew up feeling different and weird and normal. Um, so I'm just interested to know if they had a similar experience. Or... Well let's ask him because he's over there. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy, what do you think? Um, personally, I feel quite similar to my brother. Um, I've had the same kind of issues and the same kind of growing into my identity and trying to figure out where I fit into the world. Uh, we've had quite similar li lives uh, so far, so I do feel that helps in kind of creating this connection. But I do feel similarity, yeah. <laughs> right, room for one final question. Yeah, hi, um, change and I think of the American, uh, you know, the black civil rights movement in the U.S. As a, as a very big example. But I find identity politics exclusionary. Um, and because identity is so ambiguous, it's so open to change. And so I guess I would, if I would like people to, to come away from my talk taking one thing, it would be to try and disrupt the own, uh, your own identity politics and, and try and break it down and, and bridge gaps between, between different people and different communities. Because I think wanting to belong is almost a knee-jerk reaction, and I would and I would urge people to go a step beyond that and question why you feel certain identities over others, because it's all political, right? I mean, the identities that you hold dear to your hearts are often, um, you often feel that way because of certain environments or politics that you're exposed to, and, and to question that and build the, the, you know, build the links in your mind between those things is important. Great, and on the note of uh, disrupting the idea of identity and building on the theme